It's story time. Chapter 1 His Little Devil by Hero My friends call me Hero. I'm from the Philippines, specifically an urbanized region called Angeles City. I am a practicing witch, although my specialty is that of Western witchcraft, tarot, messenger magic, and not of the local kind, albulario, animism, shamanism. I was raised in a traditional Filipino household, and similar to what you said from your podcasts, superstitions and local belief are definitely ingrained in my family. My mother, especially, was a firm believer in geomancy and green magic. She had these charms and crystals littered all over our house, changing each of their positions every year to bring good energies into the house and fend off dark energies. She also had these little friends, as what she calls them, that she brings sweet offerings to in our herb garden because she believes that they are also a contributor to the peace in our household. Needless to say, all this mysticism was passed on to me, her eldest. So back when I was in my last year of college, my friends and I, our little witch clique, as what we had called it since most of us bonded over the supernatural and most of us were practicing witches, planned to get together in our favorite cafe. It had been quite a while since we had seen each other because we were working our asses off with our theses. The day arrived, and I was caught off guard by this terribly handsome man that had tagged along with my best friend, Marie. She introduced him as Van, a fellow student who she asked to tag along on our lunch date, hoping that we make friends with him because of our common interests, the supernatural. Knowing Marie, she was definitely pining for him. I mean, who wouldn't? He was average in height, had dark hair, a lean build, and there was something about his gaze that kept me on edge the whole time. It wasn't threatening, it was more alluring. If looks could kill, well, my poor heart would have died a thousand times already because of how he kept on looking at me. He had this aura that was literally inviting. And as expected, when he talked, he was a good speaker, and there was a hint of playful flirtiness in his tone. My poor heart. We had small talk, enjoyed lunch, and got back to graduation preparation soon after. Lo and behold, we were privately messaging days after. He was rather sweet. I entertained him as we talked about anything we could talk about for nights on end. He was, naturally, full of innuendo and very flirtatious, which amused me greatly since I was already deprived because of the stress of college. Small chats turned into all-nighters, where we would call from midnight until dawn. My sleeping schedule was nearly non-existent because of this. It was fun at first, but soon it became draining. I turned for the worse, Sleeping in classes, barely finishing projects on time. My grades had plummeted in my last year of college, but I didn't care. In my head, as long as I could talk to Van every night, I was going to be okay. I relished in his sweet words, his captivating deep voice, and his overwhelming presence were all that I had lived for. Looking back at it today, I never felt like that even with my current boyfriend of five years. It was addicting. He would laugh at my stories, playfully calling me his little devil. My wake-up call was not far off. It started with my mother, with a stern face, saying, there's something wrong. I've been trying to find out where it's coming from, but it's you. You reek like one of those things outside the house. As I said before, my mother was a spiritually sensitive person, and I knew exactly what she was talking about. For her, I smelled like an evil spirit. I jokingly dismissed her and said that it was probably a dead rat behind my shelves, 
and she was probably just overreacting. A week had passed, and I got together with Marie and the others. Surprisingly, Van was not there, and neither was Marie. I dismissed it. They were probably too busy. Later that night, before I was going to engage in another night of sleepless banter with Van, Marie called my phone. Hey, hero. Sorry I couldn't come earlier at lunch. I was feeling a bit sick. I haven't been sleeping lately. Hey, no worries. College can be rough sometimes. We could just meet up sometime and get coffee. My treat. Thanks. I've been staying up like every night on the phone with Van. And honestly, Hero, I think he might be the one. Uh, I'm sorry, can you say that again? Uh, Who have you been talking to? Van, dummy. You know, the guy I introduced to everyone last month. We've been calling nonstop every day, and I'm really into him. Hero? Are you there? What happened? Marie, when you call Van, do you hang up in between calls? Like, are there intervals? Nope. We usually call from, like, 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. Non-stop. Why? Marie, I'm on the phone with Van every night. From 1 to 6 a.m. What? I rejected all of Van's calls that day. And the days after. How was this even possible? Can he call two people at the same time? And was he talking to anybody else? Was this an elaborate joke that was planned by some graduate just to make fun of us? I didn't even know what to believe. My anxiety and depression spiraled downward even more because this routine of mine was cut off all of a sudden. I didn't know who to trust anymore. It was like I was going through withdrawal. Marie and I got together that weekend. She too had decided to reject all of Van's calls. I trusted Marie more than I trust any guy we had met. For years, she was like the sister I never had growing up. I came out to her before I came out gay to my parents. So I knew that when she said that she stopped answering his calls, she meant it. We met up with the Lola of a friend who was an experienced Montethawas, and immediately she said, even before sitting down, Oh, you've been dealing with one of them, hmm? He's got his fingerprints all over your body. Lola Trinidad sat us down and began her ritual of Pagtatawas. This is a ritual wherein victims, or the Mantatawas themselves, hold a blessed candle over a basin of water. Wax shapes then float towards the surface of the water that the Mantatawas then interprets. I see two people, two spirits. You've been playing with a man who is possessed by something dark. I can feel murderous intent. It is overshadowing him. The demon, it is playful, tempting. It likes that you give it attention. Yes, it feeds off of you. I see him holding hands with the dark entity. The man, he is aware of the dark presence. In fact, he nurtures it. He takes care of it. He takes it as part of himself. There is no saving him from his fate. We asked if we could do something about our situation. Lola Trinidad said that by severing our connection with Van, we had already overcome the spirit by depriving it of our attention. As long as neither of you have slept with him yet, he can't do anything to you. Thankfully, none of us had. Years had passed, and we had forgotten all about Van, until we saw him on the news. He was being arrested for murder. My friends and I couldn't help but wonder, what if that had been us? Have you ever been in a relationship where you felt like you lost yourself? That's what succubi and incubi do. These are entities that steal your energy through sex, usually when you're sleeping. If they do this often enough, the victim will find their health deteriorating, sometimes to the point of death. 
A succubus is thought to be a female demon who attacks men, and an incubus is a male demon who attacks women. But this is incredibly heteronormative, as a lot of our paranormal vocabulary can be. They are actually the same entity who possesses the ability to change their form. I'm sure most of you know at least one person who was dating someone that no one could understand why. And no matter how hard everyone tries to convince them to leave, they can't. It's hard to pull yourself out of a spell that you don't even know you're under. And whether or not these people were dealing with something supernatural, like Hero, I think it's important to remember that humans are just as capable of stealing your energy. 